bit more on the Muslim Brotherhood. I mean, um, I think uh, we were talking earlier about Muslim Brotherhood, like, you know, making deals with the army, but then, you know, there's probably, you know, there are divisions within the Brotherhood, but I don't know if those divisions are powerful enough or in the majority enough to kind of be more a force for the, the, the revolution as opposed to possibly with the counter. I was going to pick up on the on the question of imperialism, and I think why it's, I think, becoming quite an interesting development, which is the, if, if you like, so much the retreat, the weakening of US imperialism in the Middle East, and the kind of emergence of Turkey as a kind of, you know, it's a trillion dollar economy now, it's becoming much, much more on the front foot, um, in terms of being much more active uh, in its turn east policy. And I just wondered what, what your thoughts were on how, how significant that is, and how you think that, 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 that can shift things. Just going back to what Simon said, not only for question of imperialism, but question of imperialistic rivalries. I mean, what we see, for example, in Libya, I mean, France is basically trying to be on the front line. And what I see in relation to Britain and what William Hague is doing recently is trying to like really be on the front line on any possible intervention in Iran, not necessarily military, but having taken the kind of upper hand and being the kind of vanguard of, of attack on the issues around human rights in Iran. I can see that they're worried if something else happened and they're just far beyond, uh, far, far behind like America or France or other country countries, they, they're going to lose it. So what about kind of the kind of rivalry between different different imperialist forces. Firstly, the point about the Muslim Brotherhood is a very important one to, one to raise. And that what we've seen since, in fact before the revolution started in, back in January, is the intense contradictions working themselves out on, on, on the Brotherhood. Um, that if you look at the way that the Brotherhood reacted to the to the call, the call for mobilisation on the 25th of January, the, bread, the leadership was not in favour of it, and the, the mass of, of large parts of the membership went into the streets, and that set up a huge contradiction. Within a few weeks, the, the leadership was there trying to do deals with the Muslim man and, and trying to sell out the movement to the streets, and was forced to kind of come back on that. And that tension has continued. So you've continued to have attempts by the by the leadership to. Um, you know, do a deal with, with the military in the sense that um, they believe that by making some kind of partnership with the people who are with the generals, that they will get an enlarged space in which political space in which they can operate. So that they were excluded from the mainstream of politics. They were excluded from having you know, the representation that would be commensurate with their size and influence in Parliament, and that. They were faced horrendous persecution by the regime at various times, and they think that, ironically, as a consequence of a policy which they, the leadership, completely rejected, which was the uh, the movement in the streets and the, and the protests from below, that they can gain some of this. The problem that they have faced is that the military is not so far being willing to. You know, make the make make these kind of uh, arrangements work, so that for months there's been this process of saying the elections will take place um, among brothers, supporters, and so on. That we will get something out of the elections, and therefore people should not go into Tahrir on certain days. That they should not participate in the movement in the streets. That they should, you know, they hang back from doing things. Where the, the tension will continue is that if that if that can you know. If the elections then turn out to be something that offers even even less than was being previously uh, dangled in front of the government leadership, how far that will still continue to hold the membership, um, it's very hard to say. The army might one of the, make a big mistake. Yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, it's very hard to say how the dynamics will play out, but I think that it's to see the problem as being uncomplicatedly kind of reactionary block on maps that is. You know, being directed from the top by the, by the generals misses the dynamics of what's going on. I only worry that people will just vote for them because it's quite, I don't know, maybe. But if I may, let me just I come in with a little exchange. Um, I was in Cairo a couple of
couple of weeks ago. I was there for the uh, teachers, uh, time of the teachers' strike, the national teachers' strike, and there was a demonstration of 40 or 50,000 people uh, on Saturday, which I attended, and it was a very, very striking event in all sorts of ways. Uh, teachers came from all over the country, they kept arriving in delegations. Tanta, Mansoura, Zagazi, uh, Kafra Sher. You saw these people coming in in delegations. And that's important because provincial teachers have been the milieu of the Muslim Brotherhood. Hassan al Banna himself, who founded the Muslim Brotherhood in 1928, was a teacher in Ismailia. I was thinking of this when the Ismailia delegation marched down the street. And at the start of the demonstration, there were a few shouts, a few chants of Allahu Akbar. Uh, but actually, as time passed, this demonstration went on all day. The slogans changed. And as the delegations arrived, hundreds and hundreds at a time, they were chanting as if they had, you know, they were organized this national. They were chanting um, the teachers demand the fall of the minister, you know, which is the Echoing, which is the slogan of Tahrir, except instead of a shad, it was Ma'alim. And Irhan, but referring to the education minister. And there was a very, very <coughs> radical tone. They were very angry. I uh, had discussions with a, a number of them about the predicament of teachers. Uh, most of them were members of the independent, there's a the number of new independent teachers' unions. And they were there in defiance of the Muslim Brotherhood leadership, which has controlled the old syndicate, the old trade union of the teachers for many, many years. So uh, he, I thought it was a very uh, important uh, event in, in, in demonstrating the breadth and depth of the revolution. The way that the Egyptian revolution has reached into every area of the society, I mean, perhaps less so in the countryside, actually, but nonetheless, every area of urban society, and is engaged, if you like, constituencies and networks, which were uh, not the obvious area for mass collective struggle. Uh, I, I was wondering, you know, what the uh, various dignitaries of the Brotherhood were making of this, because as one of our socialist friends said in the discussion we had on that demonstration, he made us make the point. He said, "These people are not our enemies." On the contrary, these are desperate people. The other thing about the demonstration is that the, um, the events of Tahrir, at least initially, were, of course, youthful. They were youthful. Um, <coughs> folks like me, grey-headed old men like me, made up much of the teachers' demonstration, and their slogans were more or less as radical as the slogans of Tahrir. So I just make this point because I think that the type of understanding of Islamist movements that we come equipped with in our particular political tradition, which has developed over some years, is seeing Islamist movements as very, very contradictory. And sure enough, having I mean, conservative core, in class terms a conservative core as well, but also ideologically conservative. Um, but because of the lack of alternatives for, uh, uh, to express radical ambition or ambition for some sort of change, over the last 30 or 40 years or so, the Islamists have type of cornered the market in, in, a, in apparent opposition to regimes. I mean, there could be no more classic example than the example of Iran, which we'll be dealing with. I think Iran, is, as, as, as the months pass in the Arab countries, the question of Iran becomes more and more important, actually, of understanding what happened then and what's happened since. I mean, the question of, I mean, the Americans were right in the West. Where did Khomeini come from? You know, they were worried about the Tulip Party and, and the Fadayid and the Mujahideen and these guerrilla organisations. They hadn't been paying attention, really, to the impact in Iranian society of the failure of the left and, and the earlier generation of nationalists. And much of the same has happened in the Arab world. So, but when these Islamist movements find themselves under pressure from mass movements, they start splintering and coming apart. And the Muslim Brotherhood is not in a good state of health. Um, it's not to say that it can't recover and make a mark in the elections. It can make a mark. But it is not the sinister, mass, 
homogenous block of reactionaries that the European and American press and many academics and others make it out to be. And you see that every day in the streets of Cairo. You know, to repeat the cliche, they're always fighting the last wall. So they didn't, as, as Phil said, they didn't notice uh, the potential that Khomeini and the Islamists had during the Iranian Revolution. They've now corrected for that mistake, so they're completely obsessed with the Islamists. But in fact, if we look at what's happening in the Arab world, there are all sorts of secular forces that are emerging and in lots of ways are driving the process, and even when the Islamists are involved, in all sorts of ways shaping, shaping what the Islamists do. But that wasn't the, the point I wanted to come in on. It was on the question that Ali raised about inter-imperialist rivalries. I don't myself think that the British and French uh, are terribly important. It's true in the particular context of Libya, which was a small war, um, you know, a, small, a civil war on a small scale, you know, between a regime that was disintegrating and quite extensive popular op opposition. They could tilt the balance, but even then, they ran out of bombs and they were very heavily dependent on American support. So I, I'm skeptical that they can play a big regional role, although clearly, you know, Sarkozy and Cameron like to kid themselves that they can. I think the question of the rivalries between sub-imperialisms, would-be sub-imperialisms in the region is much more interesting because what you've seen, and the most important example of this is Turkey under Erdogan, um, where, you know, he's playing quite an ambiguous role because on the one hand, he's much more willing to confront Israel, although it's mainly verbally, he's threatened to send the Turkish Navy to accompany the next convoy to Gaza, but, you know, that's, you know, that's a, a still words. And so on. But nevertheless, the, the, the fact that Erdogan has turned so hard against Israel is an important factor in the isolation of Israel. But there's also a very nasty little conflict brewing over natural gas reserves that have been discovered in the eastern Mediterranean, where the, the southern Cyprus government, the Greek, you know, the notionally official government of, of Cyprus, wants to develop these reserves. Erdogan you know, reflecting the fact the Turkish state has its own um, client regime in northern Cyprus is saying that he won't, won't allow that. There's been a certain amount of sabre rattling. The Greek government has come in on the side of, um, of, of, of the southern Cyprus government. You can understand why the Greek government would like to revive the idea of the Turkish menace at this price, precise moment in in, in Greek society, there's the potential. The Greek government wants to align it, itself against Turkey, not just with Cyprus, but with, but it, with Israel. So you can see the way in which, even though the big robber is, it, is undoubtedly uh, very much weakened in how it confronts the, the Arab, Arab revolutions, the medium sized robbers are all, um, uh, you know, put, feeling more confident, partly because of the weakening of the US uh, and the chronic weakness of the European powers and seeking to, to, to assert their influence which, with potentially quite, quite dangerous consequences. So to add what Alex, I mean, at the same time I didn't mention the possibility of like China as well, in, in inter-imperialist inter like rivalry, but, but in the regional kind of sub-imperialist rivalries, what we see in the last two years is extreme weakening of Iranian government, which had the chance previously to be a kind of to be a hub in order to attract many of these uh, kind of, uh, forces, Islamist forces across the region, both Hamas and kind of within Muslim Brotherhood, with all the differences between Salafis and Shiites and Sunnis. But then, at least ideologically, Iran, Iranian government has lost that that uh, that has lost that kind of strength point, and I, I know that because. We, the stories coming out of Iran is somehow out of control. We are not talking about the Green Movement. We are talking about the battle between Ahmadinejad, man of people, and Khomeini. We are talking about like three billion dollar of like one occasion of a scandal uh, theft, basically, by Ahmadinejad people. And those things don't attract people in the region anymore as they used to do before. Hence, the strong reaction of like even Muslim Brotherhood during the Egyptian Revolution against what Khomeini said, which is this is the continuation of Iranian thing. 
And, and the second thing is I've been kind of following in Al Jazeera, every time you have a single Muslim brotherhood speak here, they come as if like they are in the mission, saying that don't connect us to Iranian Islamists. We are following Turkish model. Yeah? And basically that's somehow sending a message to the West that we are not going to intervene or kind of any, produce any conflict against no liberal kind of economy. We are going to play the game better than every other uh, political faction. At the same time, somehow kind of the situation has happened to the extent that Turkish government see themselves in the place of becoming a regional superpower. Only in the last two years. I mean, what happened with Israel is only kind of this uh, superstructure, kind of symbolic presentation of that. The reason they are kind of talking so much against Israel is because they realize the game is much more than what they would have previously by allying themselves with Israel. And, and that's why, kind of in a sense, kind of, Turkey has this kind of has this symbolic position at the moment to be, to kind of go toward a form of 21st century Ottoman Empire as they imagine themselves. First of all, the question of the army in Egypt in particular. Um, and to link that to the elections, one, one expression that I didn't use, one phrase, term I didn't use earlier on, which I probably should have done, is the term permanent revolution. Because what we're seeing underway in Egypt in particular is a process of political and social change in which struggles of various sorts, some struggles which have a primary economic orientation like some of the labour disputes and other struggles which are more specifically directed towards the question of political rights and so on, fuse in various ways and develop energy and momentum which takes the movement forward in you know, ever more, in ever wider and a sharper fashion. And it seems to me to be absolutely clear that really since the beginning of events <coughs> in, in Egypt earlier this year, we've seen what one might term a classic process of permanent revolution unfolding. And this is the military's difficulty, of course. Now, how on earth do you second guess the Egyptian military? I don't know. You know, these people have always been highly, highly secretive outfits. I mean, think, until the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the SCAF, declared itself in Egypt as the people who take over from Mubarak, most Egyptians had never heard of this outfit and they've got no idea who these generals were. And even a whole lot of people who would be well attuned to Egyptian politics, people knew Pampao, but who the hell were these other guards? These type of sinister figures and so on. Every single one of them handpicked by Mubarak and his mates. And every single one of them been through American military academies. We shouldn't forget that. The link to the Americans is very, very close. But I think there's a lot of evidence um, accruing that the vision of the generals, the people they're close to, closest to in Egyptian society, who are the nouveau riche. You know, the people who were favoured and um, uh, encouraged by Mubarak and his nepotistic networks, the likes of Suiris and the other millionaires, and these are people who, in terms of um, material interests the, and, and networking, so on, the generals are closest to. What, what did the generals think they were doing? I think it's very likely they thought they were progressing Egypt towards an election, which they, the outcome of which that they hoped would, they could shape as congenial to them so that Egypt continued much as before with a, a type of you know, democratic, um, what's the term I'm looking for, you know, a superficial democracy in place, so that there would be relatively open, in Mubarak's terms at least, relatively open in terms of the past, political party activity. And that people would celebrate the election like the people of South Africa did when they went to the polls after the fall of the apartheid regime. And that they went, you go to vote, you get a new parliament, and then this is what you fought for. And then what, you, what your job as an Egyptian to do is to bend to the will of uh, the parliament and to the historic role of the Egyptian state and Egyptian army. I think mean, that's probably what most of the generals thought they were trying to do. But the process of permanent revolution doesn't permit that nice outcome of the elections in November. Because people have been engaged in these complex interlocking and interacting struggles, which are taking them, which have maintained pressures and extended the scale of the activity way beyond what the military can permit. Hence, the attack on the March in Abyssinia in July, 
and it seems to me, um, the events of outside uh, Mas Biron, the uh, television centre the other day with the, uh, the, the mass murders which took place there. I just want to make one quick observation about that, which brings also into our discussion the question of the state. Um, I think it's quite unlikely that Pantawi and his friends planned the events um, uh, of the Sunday before last. Quite unlikely that they, that they had an agenda for dealing with the demonstration of the many Coptic demonstration that arrived from Shubra and the people who were there to support it. But I think what did happen is that they dispatched certain units of the military police to intervene, that's, you know, depending upon the mood of the crowd and so on and so forth. And of course, once what they were doing, they were mobilising units of security forces, which over the last 30 years have been, have been built up as one of the most repressive outfits in the global south. I mean, the Egyptian, you know, the Egyptian state has been a particularly horrible and bloody and nasty outfit. Um, some of our friends in Egypt have had to become experts in monitoring uh, practices of torture by the army and the police. And the record of the Egyptian state is second to none in terms of torturing and killing. Remember the run of the Egyptians with the British and the Americans in the process of, uh, uh, I always forget it, rendition. rendition, extraordinary rendition. So the Egyptian state has kind of entered over the last 20 years, particularly the last 10 years, the Egyptian state entered the lives of millions of families in the most brutal way, which is one reason why those people came to Tahrir in the way they did, fighting for their lives. So you let loose a couple of these units on the Corniche at the television centre, and these people are back in business. You know, those officers are back in business, shooting at people, putting out snipers, sending APCs to Rolo. It's like they let loose the dogs. They let loose the dogs. Whether quite whether they intended to do that or not, and it does seem to me that what this means a type of harbinger, really, unfortunately, of what could be further episodes in which, if the regime, because of the unfolding process of the revolution, feels itself compelled to respond in these ways, that the stakes are going to rise very, very sharply. People will find themselves confronted more and more by the scenarios of Tahrir. I mean, I don't think that's inevitable. And also, more and more by scenarios like Syria. Sorry, well, no, what I mean, sorry, the scenarios of Tahrir in which the gangs were brought to fight the, against the movement. Uh, it, yes, the but gangs, maybe. You mean the army outright fighting? Well, yeah, the army, the, the gangs, yeah. yeah. Syria, yes. But the difference, of course, between now and then is we have seen these repeated waves of mass struggle. A really significant feature in the process of permanent revolution is the engagement of battalions of Egyptian workers. And, and so this, it's not just folks fighting the police now. And, and this needs to be factored into our consideration of the way the revolution progresses, it seems to me. I think that the key argument that we need to be making at the moment is that what has changed the situation and the reason that the generals are in the state of paralysis and crisis that they're in is because of the intervention of the organized working class in a way that we have not seen in Egyptian history for 60 years, and we haven't seen in the region um, for, well, large parts of the region for 30 years. We have to go back to the Iranian Revolution to see this degree of organization from below being built out of mass strike work, which for all the world looks very, very much like what Rosa Luxemburg described in 1905. And there are many elements of the 1905 revolution in Russia but I think are present at the moment in the Egyptian in the Egyptian situation. Um, okay, the Soviet, not yet, but you know, many of the other building blocks are there in terms of the crisis of the state, uh, in terms of the the way that the movement worked with was developed, um, particularly in terms of the the organisation that has been built out of the out of the strike waves the last, particularly the last four to five six weeks, which is a qualitative change from anything that we saw coming out of the, on the scale that we saw coming out of the 2006, post-2006 strike wave. Um, I have spent the last several weeks reading reports of, of 750 separate episodes of collective action that took place since March this year, and you can see very clear patterns building up 
of moving from workplace, the workplace struggles in the workplace, which are incredibly intense, by the way. I mean, we're talking about mini revolutions in thousands of workplaces where people went on the 13th of February into work and said, right, I'm going to get rid of the little Mubarak who is mm. our boss. I did it. Um, so it's not to belittle the struggles in the workplace, but most of those struggles took place within the confines of a single workplace without conscious coordination beyond that workplace. But then over the following few months, you get to see, you see building up regional strikes, local strikes, building up into some very serious national strikes, the teachers, but not only the teachers, we examine the whole of the, <coughs> the whole of the sugar sector, sugar workers were out on strike a few weeks ago. Their coordinating committee is called the, the 25th of January Coalition or something like that. At the moment there's a strike, an all-out strike by telecoms workers, mm. but they threatened to cut down, shut off the internet, mm. which I thought was quite a, a good way of getting your demands notice. And you know, there are strike after strike building up. And we have to say as well that it is it is the intervention of this wave of strikes of, of, of the organised working class which has shifted the, the, the situation from what we saw at the beginning of August when the military went in and shut down the city in Tahrir and were able to use and the biggest of mobilisation that they facilitated to close off that space and quieten the streets. And what opened it was the workers' movement. And that is the central, if, if we take nothing else from this, that is what we have to share to people. Um, I was wondering, um, from now on, how would you, how you would assess the uh, situation of Iran in relation to what happened in Egypt, as, um, as for example, as Ali said, uh, the government is uh, weak now, but you've got a very repressive regime under Khamenei who's um, uh, managing all the kind of military services and uh, forces. So um, it's really important to notice how and to know how um, um, how powerful the Iranian army is mm. and how repressed young people are. Mm. So I think, and, and, and besides, that we've got new generations uh, who didn't have to do anything with the uh, 1979 revolution. So I was wondering how you would see um, uh, the relationship between the Egyptian revolution and the new generations in Iran. <coughs> I know it's a very big question. <laughs> Again, it was responding to something that Ali said, which is, I think the reason why Iranian influence is the, the kind of political appeal that Ahmadinejad undoubtedly had a few years ago has declined, isn't just because of the repression of the Green Movement and the implosion of the regime itself, it's also because the regime has taken up such an ambiguous attitude to the Arab revolutions. You know, they were very happy when Mubarak went because nothing to do with their pro-American and so on. But Syria, Syria is a much more difficult issue for them because they're so closely allied to Assad. And therefore, although they've made criticisms, they're not stupid. They're not at all stupid, the Iranian regime. But nevertheless, fundamentally, they support Assad. And that, in turn, has affected the whole configuration of anti-imperialist forces in the regime. Hezbollah has lined up along with, uh, uh, along with Ir the Iranian regime in supporting Assad. Moqtada al-Sadr in, Ira Ir in Iraq, the most consistent opponent of the occupation, also supports Assad, as does, incidentally, the Iraqi government, which is an indication of the great geopolitical victory that the US won in invading Iraq. It can't even control the foreign policy of its client, own client regime. Um, but I mean, I think that, and that, I mean, that sort of reshuffled the, the cards politically on quite a big, a, a big scale in the region. And I think it points to one issue that we're going to come up in, in uh, come up with in future meet, meetings. For example, Mohammed's meeting about the whole history of Arab nationalism and so on, is there's a strong tendency on the left to support regimes that have some kind of anti-imperialist record. And if you're very, very generous, you can say that of the Assad regime. I mean, the, it's, it's an extremely inconsistent record, but there's some history of confronting the Americans and the Israelis. And there's a section of the left, for example here, which, because of that record, support, also supports the, the regime, and that is a, a much longer, longer history where you don't look at the internal class situation 
in a country. You look simply at the geopolitical alignment of the, the regime. And this is a, it's a very important lesson for the, um, for the left, both in the region and internationally, to learn that you don't base your attitude to a regime on the extent to which you agree with its foreign policy. First point is that um, there is a tremendous unevenness that it's also taking place. I think that also reflects the, 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 the nature of the region. So you have, if you like, inside of Egypt, <coughs> a huge street movement that does all the things you want a street movement to do, set fire to police stations, drive the security forces off the streets and so on. But at the same time, a quite well developed workers movement that had been placing itself in, you know, um, uh, in, 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 in a good position since Really the last four or five, six, seven years, how the Kubra, the strike waves, and so on, how that, um, how these two things came together inside of Egypt, and what I see as being drawing the wrong lessons, which I think uh, a lot of people have from the Egyptian Revolution, but it's simply about Tahrir, it's simply about the street movement, and if we look at Yemen, they say they have a street movement that can, you know, put all of us to shame when you get demonstrations the size of the ones you get in Yemen with a million people on it, and so on, yet still unable to even take that first step of, 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 uh, of throwing uh, Ali Saleh. But at the same time, there is things that are taking place now that uh, a year ago, I think, would have sent us into, you know, paroxysms of joy, uh, but now almost go unnoticed. For example, I don't know if people know, but there's a huge strike wave in Kuwait. Um, started with the dock workers a couple of weeks ago, spread to the custom workers, uh, the teachers and now the whole of the civil servant, uh, civil services out strike, and these are winning. These are a, a very important strikes, but there's no big street movement. Yeah, it's shaking and really te um, uh, uh, terrifying the Kuwaiti regime to the extent that today there was an editorial by uh, the, the the chairman of the, one of the biggest construction companies in um, in, uh, 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 in United Arab Emirates, where he's pointing the finger of blame for the Kuwaiti strikes at the Egyptian workers. See what the Egyptian workers are doing is, is creating problems for us inside of Kuwait. And you begin to see this actually, that, that there is now we begin to see the development of a working class movement like in the likes we haven't seen for a very, very long time. I mean, I'm not sure Kuwait had a working class 20 or 30 years ago, but didn't when I, when I lived there anyway. But it is, uh, it, is, it is really emerging. And there is this, because of this unevenness, you are getting revolutions which are succeeding in the first stages the combination of the worker strikes and the mass demonstrations, the sexual mass demonstrations, other places where you simply have in one or the other element of it. So that because of this unevenness, I think, it actually means that there is, if you like, the, 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 the possibility of things being derailed happening very, very uh, 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 quite, um, being, being a huge danger. Syria, huge insurrection in Homs, Hamma, in these places, yeah, actually, there's, there's no worker strikes. Even though around Homs and Hamma are huge industrial complexes. Aleppo, almost untouched, big industrial uh, centers. So actually, the, when you see the movement in Syria, extremely brave, on the street, constantly, uh, you know, pulling down the statues, doing all the things we see as a revolution doing, they're actually not going into the workplace in any kind of organized way. And that, I think, this unevenness actually means that, that we are seeing not so much the end of the revolution process or the panic that a lot of people have, I think, about the end of the revolution process, but actually seeing the development of that thing, the permanent revolution, that element of permanent revolution, is the, the rising political awareness, industrial muscle of the working class across across the region. And where it's not happening, like in Libya, we're getting other elements still coming in. But where it is happening, like in Egypt, I think we begin to see the way that it's shaping. I just want to, want to finish on talking about the, the, the teachers. Um, that the Muslim Brotherhood won overwhelmingly the vote inside the teachers' union, but in the official union, not in the breakaway unions. But it's more interesting what happened inside the doctors' elections, where places where you thought were strongholds of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, such as Alexandria, actually they didn't do very well. It was actually the left kind of coalition, the, 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 the more radical doctors, were, were, were actually doing really substantially well. And I think it's really interesting because I think that, that shows that there is a tremendous pressure on the Muslim Brotherhood that is coming from this rising wind class. But it's not totally expressing itself in a way, I think, you know, that, that, that can actually take the movement to that next stage. We've seen the economic struggles and so on, that point at which it becomes political again. From Kuwait, I think, all the way through, even, even Lebanon, I mean, I mentioned, you know, Lebanon had a, 
had a, a general strife on Wednesday, but we're always kind of having those. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is really fascinating. And it is these connections that is taking place. And the thing um, that I think is more, most interesting is some of the graffiti you see, especially in southern Beirut, and Hezbollah, strong Hezbollah areas, of which the slogan a few years ago was God, Nasrallah, and the Dahi, which is the area, that's all we need to win. And now you pass through there as you see a very interesting slogan, which says victory to the revolution in Bahrain, victory to the revolution in Syria. But there is, if you like, the old, everything before now no longer exists. Hassan Nasrallah, who was loved, is now no longer loved. I mean, it's really interesting the way this is, the way this is shifting. And it is this tremendous unevenness that I think is, is, is the most exciting for us, because then it allows us, I think, to, to begin to intervene sort of generally. So. Right, a very important question about Iran. I do want to uh, come to, but I just want to say one other thing which arises from what Simon said. Something very important is going to happen tomorrow in Israel. It's the schedule, it's the day of the return of Gilad Shalit. Yeah? And everyone knows who this guy is. And Israeli society has got into a frenetic state about this. I mean, across the country, there are these yellow ribbons and flags and so on as we put out the return of Shalit. If you want to see a brilliant critique of what this represents in relation to the type of political mood and the health of the great society, there is a superb article by uh, Gideon Levy, who's one of the very, very, very few Israeli journalists who writes stuff that's readable and is very courageous in the Haaretz today, if you look on the Haaretz website. Um, but the important thing, I think, is that there's a lot of debate going on. It's who's the winner in the question of Shalit and the prisoner releases. Did Hamas win something? Hamas win something? Uh, is this a victory for Netanyahu and so on? Okay, push and pull, we each side claiming. And I think the key thing in all this, which is what the more honest Israeli journalists have got on to, is that Netanyahu could have agreed on this deal. He's had the list in his pocket or his desk drawer, for about the last four years. And he could have agreed on this deal at more or less any time. Why has he done it now? Uh, I, I think the Israelis are in, by their standards, quite a difficult place at the moment. Partly because of the change of balance of power in the region, the shift in the sub-imperialism. You know, after all, the Americans did lose Iran many years ago. Uh, they just in a superficial sense, lost Egypt at the moment. Things are very unstable. Um, Netanyahu's uh, in a relatively weak position in all sorts of ways, not least in relation to the Palestinians, where there's the Palestinian movement, although it's still in a pile of state, is in a less, is in a more invigorated state, in, in a sense, than it was some months ago. Netanyahu's had to take a decision he didn't want to take. And that's another aspect of the complexity of all these developments, and something that's going to be very important when we come to talk about Palestine. Lastly then, on the question of, of Iran, and this is, a, I think, a very, very taxing question, but if you'd like some other people in this room, I think in the meeting, I think in the next room, at which various people in this room participated in a very interesting debate about the Green Movement and Iran and the prospects and so on and so forth. And this is an extremely difficult matter to deal with. I'm just going to make two observations. One is that uh, I think that the state of affairs in Egypt um, for the mass of the population uh, has reached a much more critical point than it has yet reached in Iran. What I mean by that is that although the situation of massive Iranians is certainly a very unhappy one, Egypt has been a laboratory for neoliberalism since the Infidah policy in 1974. It's been one of the places uh, in the global south where uh, the, capitalist, the, the capitalist class globally has most vigorously pursued its agenda of marketization, privatization, and so on. With it policy. You know, in 2007, the World Bank declared Egypt its champion investor. Uh, it declared Mubarak, I should say. And Mubarak received an award from the World Bank for being the champion of investment. In other words, you know, he, he was their key figure in the global south. They wanted others to emulate in terms of marketization, liberalization, uh, privatization, and so on. And the cost of that has been absolutely immense to Egyptians. When you think that the land law reform laws 
of the Nasser period have been revoked and millions of peasants are being evicted from the land and are being directed, well, not being directed anywhere, are ending up in the cities. And increasingly, something I'm very interested in, although it's a footnote in this, is for the very, very first time in modern Egyptian history, large numbers of young Egyptians, I call them survival migrants, desperate, poor, falahim, young peasants in the villages of the Nile Delta, they're not migrating to the Gulf to work like they used to do in the 1970s. Most of those options are closed off, and they're not going to Libya for obvious reasons. What are they doing? They're getting on these shitty, leaky boats and trying to cross the Mediterranean to Italy and Greece, and hundreds of them are dying. You know, it's eloquent, it's a statement about the state of affairs in Egyptian society. Um, so the, the impacts of neoliberalism are profound. I think this process is probably more advanced than in Iran, and maybe others can prove me wrong, but uh, of course the, Egypt, the Iranian regime has bought into the neoliberal project as well. But I believe I'm right in saying that when Khomeini <coughs> and his friends and his networks came to power in the 1980s, there were agendas of the type of social reform. <coughs> you know, there was an alternative agenda to the Shah, not one that we'd embrace. But there was a certain amount of insulation built around certain sections of Iranian society. And some of this I would say it's still in place, but it's, a, it's eroding, but not at the rate of what happened in Egypt. The champion of reform. In other words, this was a society where the regime and corporate capital and so on had most ruthlessly pursued the privatisation agenda. And I think these are the, this is an absolutely, this is what makes, well, this is why people have latched onto, which is why Tahrir is the slogan of London, Paris, Denver, Tucson, isn't it? Is it not? People recognise this. Um, and this really accounts, very last point to make, I think we sort of have, I think we have run out of time, haven't we? That coming back to Tahrir, I mean, you, you, you I can't remember your name, so sorry. Liana. Liana, sorry. Liana, you, we met before you went to Egypt. Yeah. I didn't know, I hadn't realised that you'd been there for, you know, the... Um, the full show type of thing, <laughs> and that you were a participant. But watching, well, like other, watching Al Jazeera, and particularly watching the events, the 28th of January and the 2nd of February, when there were these gigantic confrontations, I was say, asking myself, will the activists be able to bring forward the troops that they need? I, everyone, every Egyptian said, are we going to be able to find the numbers to defend ourselves to survive? And the numbers came in their millions. And they came in their millions. And talking since then to many friends in Egypt, I've heard so many accounts. One friend of mine lives in Mahdi, which is a posh suburb on the east side of the Nile. He said it started with a march of a thousand on the 2nd of February. We marched from Mahdi through a very, very poor area called Dar es Salaam. He said by the time we got to the other side of Dar es Salaam, we were 40,000. Another friend marched from uh, Nasra City up in the northeast to an, a series of poor areas until they reached Ramsey Square where there was a huge fight. He said, by the time he got there, there were 50,000. Now, what, what were these people doing? There were all sorts of people with their own agendas and their political demands, but actually, <coughs> millions of these people were people who were struggling with the everyday problem of providing bread for their families. You know, the, the, Pressing, pressing material issues. Now, um, I, the situation in Iran is clearly critical, but I think probably that the armies which are people who are prepared to come onto the streets and defy the odds and run the risk of confronting the state um, in, in Egypt, you know, the volume, the density, the depth, the breadth of the movement is accounted for by the character of Egypt in this period. So, in a sense, we've got Egypt in that way. We, we don't necessarily have to say, well, um, uh, you know, can, can Iran follow? We need to look at the specific circumstances which have precipitated the events in Egypt and then think about the circumstances in Iran and see. And um, we'll learn, I think, in, in the meeting from Iran um, about, about these, uh, these matters. And of course, just one very final point on this. In, in Egypt, the mass of the people came onto the streets, and indeed, the conscript army was not mobilised to fight them. The conscript army didn't fight. The state 
didn't fracture, but the state didn't conduct itself according to the Mubarak agenda. Now, unless I'm wrong, the state in Iran um, has to be thought about in a rather different way. And I'm hoping ways that we'll learn about it when you address us in a few weeks' time. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone.